the flyer promoting this event promises that you will hear the story and see some icons and consider how this ancient art can lead us into worship and prayer. I know that you've heard a lot of the story from Vivian and some of you know the story from your own experience of iconography and of uh, art in general. Uh, you learn from Vivian about how icons are made and painted. So I'll focus on my own story and the experience and connection with contemporary iconography. So of the story. Well, my painting experience started with some dabbling in watercolour. And I love the way in which light of the light of white paper comes through uh, the paint in watercolour. Indeed, the white bits in watercolour should be the white of the paper. Not always. Uh, you know, Chinese white is sometimes used, but that's... <laughs> no, there, is, there are some occasions when that's allowed, but I uh, just love the way that, that light comes through. And then I read a book by a Norwegian iconographer called Søren Ness, who described how to paint icons of Christ and of Mary and of John the Baptist. And I had some watercolour round brushes with uh, artificial tacklon bristles and some acrylic paint and some canvas board, so I gave it a go. And I looked okay, but I'd broken a few rules. I had the wrong paint and the wrong boards. And there was no more painting for over six years, until I changed jobs from congregational ministry to presbytery ministry. And this is when I was a bit more free on a Saturday stand as a congregation minister, I was frantic on Saturday getting ready for Sunday. And so I could join the United Church Icon School run by Rob Gallagher at, Gallagher at Otira in Kew. And my interest for that was kindled by watching a colleague painting his icon during a break at a ministry retreat. Uh, Ken uh, Jilson uh, has uh, sadly uh, died some years ago, but it was Ken got me started. And on the first day I learned how to prepare a panel. It was MDF. We don't use that anymore. The, uh, it's um, uh, the, uh, uh, if you, when you saw it and route it and sand it, the, the dust is not good for balloons. So we abandoned that. But that's what we started with because it's very stable. It's not going to warp. It is solid. Well, we know it's solid, at least for, we don't know if it'll last 100 years. Some of my icons will know in about 100 years' time whether that's the case. But we started, as Vivian would have explained to you, uh, by gluing linen onto the panel and then uh, mixing whiting with the, with the glue to make the gesso. So that's what I sort of started with on the first day, but then I was given a, a ready-made panel. So the panel I was starting to prepare was for my second icon, which I didn't need for another year. <laughs> uh, so I started to paint on the first day. And uh, I was mixing raw pigment with egg and water and white vinegar and just a drop of vodka. <gasps> These days, because it's simpler and because it's more effective and keeps for months in the fridge, uh, egg yolk, one part egg, egg yolk, one part white wine. It smells better <laughs> and uh, it just keep, that bit of alcohol just helps. That, that's why the vodka was used. By the end of the year I'd finished my first icon, so the journey had begun and 10 years later, about 30 icons later, I was starting to get the hang of it. Uh, in that lot there, probably the Christ paint powder is the only one that goes back to that year. All the rest are uh, since that time. In that time I had made a few changes. I was preparing panels of pine or ply because of the nasty effect of MDF. 
uh, which is certainly not a traditional material. I was also routing out an indented area leaving a raised frame, which I think all of those bowels are too. So you can see they're indented. Uh, and in, for, in practical terms, that's to protect the icon. And because it's a protection, it's called an arc, because the arc protected the animals in the flood. In Greek, it's called a kivitos. In Russian, it's called a kolchek. The one constant through all of this journey was my faithful old watercolour Teflon brushes. I was being supported by some very fine artists at the Icon School. Uh, some artists who were very good in other areas of art. And one, one, one fascinating lady was um, Faye. She was the court artist. So during the week she would, she would say she was painting bad people and then she'd come on <laughs> Saturday to paint good people. We always thought that some of her good people looked like they were in the dock, but, <laughs> but, but she, I mean, she was fantastic. She had learned uh, portraiture in, in Europe. And so you know, she would explain to us about uh, proportions and stuff like that. It was so helpful. Uh, but there were, uh, we were getting also instruction from uh, videos and, and particularly from books. And Aidan Hart, who is a, uh, he's in, born in New Zealand, but he lives in the UK. Uh, he uh, has converted to uh, Greek Orthodoxy and he learned the craft. I mean, he paints and carves and does mosaics. He's been doing this for about 30 years and he learned in Athens, in, um, uh, in Greece, not in Athens, but um, uh, uh, one of the great monasteries. And, and he is the authority and his book is monumental and it describes everything you ever want to know about how to paint icons and how to prepare the panels and how to photograph them. And the most frustrating thing about his book is it doesn't have an index. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Where is that? Yeah. Yeah. He's recently, and I just got it last week, written another book on the icons of the festivals, another monumental uh, volume. So uh, that book is, I mean, it's always out of the library being poured over. If anything, I had too many influences and I was not really finding my own style. I painted intuitively, that is, I just mucked around, I dabbled, I, I uh, tried to correct mistakes and, and that worked really well. Another fantastic teacher in the school uh, it was Rita Magras, again another uh, of our artists who has died. And she was a very, very devout Catholic lady who was a teacher of art and craft. And, and I said to her, you know, you, the way you describe how to do stuff, I said, I just muck around and, and, and do it intuitively. She said, so do I, but because I have to teach, I have to break it all down uh, into steps. And, and that was so helpful. Her, she would what Rob Gallagher taught her, and I think it was a John Bainton uh, 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 dictum too, is that you, uh, you painted the face last. Uh, but Rita wanted to paint the face first because she wanted to be in relationship with that face as she clothed the, the saint. And uh, she would use very thin uh, flesh colour Strokes, which would go right across the face, you know, out onto the onto the rest of the, the icon, and then she would start to do the uh, uh, the shading, and then the highlights, and bit by bit, these beautiful faces emerged, and then she would, uh, with all these bits hanging off <laughs> the, the edge, uh, she was wonderful. Uh, as to 2013 approached, I was preparing for retirement <coughs> with many plans for how this new phase of my life would unfold. Rob Gallagher was considering how the Icon Schools could have a life after he was no longer able to drive it. 
So he asked if I would help run the schools. One day a month each uh, at the Auburn Uniting Church Hall, which is a really, it was, he set up as a, a going concern uh, with uh, a, a very good storeroom uh, with a workshop out the back and the hall could be set up uh, in, in, in whatever, uh, we can house 20 artists at a time to, to paint in the hall and give them plenty of space. Uh, so it was a good running concern and he wanted help. The tricky bit was that I was to help teach icon painting. Rob had recently returned from an icon workshop in Shropshire learning from who else but Aidan Hart. And uh, he had said to Rob, and he was a bit amazed that Rob was teaching this stuff, uh, that in the Greek Orthodox world, iconographers did not teach the craft before they painted about 200 icons. Well, I was about 180 icons short of that. <laughs> and also at this stage, I had not had professional instruction. We were, I mean, Rob was the authority, certainly the authority on history and theology. He was fantastic on that stuff. Um, and he'd, he had uh, learned uh, from uh, an iconographer in Finland uh, and from, uh, from John Beatty. Um, but he's not a professional iconographer any, any more than I am. Uh, uh, we, we are amateurs. Well, Sister Margaret Broadbent, a Catholic nun, is an artist and a teacher. And she'd led a tour party to St Petersburg and there she discovered Philip Davidov and his wife Olga Shronova. And I just want to bring up uh, an image of them. There they are, in, uh, that's uh, in their... Uh, studio in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, and Philip, he's fluent, of course, in Russian, fluent in English, fluent in Italian. So he teaches in Russia, Italy, USA, Canada, and was able to be easily persuaded to come to Melbourne every January uh, to run at least two, sometimes three weeks of, of, of uh, workshops at the art space in Fitzroy of the uh, Australian Catholic University. <coughs> so that's where I started to come under the tutelage of professional iconographers. At last I had an anchor point for my painting and a firm friendship in this couple. So what changed? At the start of the first painting demonstration by Philip, I realised my technique was seriously under attack. Philip was painting an egg tempera onto a perpendicular surface, not onto a flat surface. Didn't he realise that the paint would drip all over the place? Egg tempera is runny. It is not a toothpaste consistency like an oil paint or acrylic. It's like watercolour, and everyone knows that watercolour is painted on a horizontal or near horizontal surface so that the paint doesn't run. Not only was Philip about to make a nasty runny mess, but he was adding far too much egg tempera to his dried pigment. I had been taught to mix pigment and egg in about equal parts. Too much egg and the result would be shiny and lumpy and could be described as, well, eggy, not nice. What sort of artist could make so many of these basic mistakes? But I opened my mind to new possibilities. <laughs> Philip mixed his paint in a small dish, grinding it with a pestle. He tested the colour on a scrap of paper and waited for it to dry, because most pigments dry darker. Yeah. So he, waiting will reveal a true result. He added and tested until he was satisfied. Then came the ritual of applying the paint to his panel. It was the same each time his brush went dry. He loaded his brush by stirring the mixture. See, paint 
in this mix. It's a mixture, it's not a compound. Yeah. I know some of you are pharmacists, you will understand what I'm talking about. The, the pigment will start to drop to the bottom straight away. So if you're just taking your paint off the top each time, the, uh, the consistency, the, the, uh, uh, the tone will be different. So you've got to stir it each time. And then he would wipe off the brush. 15, 16, 17 times, and then start to paint. And the result was a thin layer, which of course is what Rita had been doing, applying everything in thin layers, so that what was happening? The white of the panel is still coming through, like in watercolour. Now, this isn't the only way to paint icons. There are wet ways, there are dry ways, there are soggy ways. There are all sorts of ways of doing it. God didn't say thou shalt... Well, God said thou shalt not paint icons. I mean, he did that in the second commandment. But no. <laughs> but when we got over that and disobeyed that quite thoroughly, um, there isn't one way to do it. But this was a way which I could connect with because of my watercolour experience. Um, and, and, and he was also adding a lot more egg than I would, but it wasn't eggy because it was because it was so thin, and and, and so I recognised because I've been a teacher for nine years. I recognised that he was a really good teacher. He used time-honoured teaching method. The student watches the teacher demonstrate the next step, then carries out that step while the teacher looks over the shoulder giving advice and correction, uh, then back to the uh, demonstration for the next step. And I can hear Philip behind me saying, mm, tuck. Now those of you who are fluent in Russian will know he's saying, so. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> and w there would come his advice, his correction. And I'm thinking, hang on, I'm doing mine better than him over there or her over there. That didn't worry him. What he was doing was taking me from this level of competence to that level of competence. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about them, it was about me. Mm -hmm. It just took me a little while to <coughs> yeah. Yeah. connect with that. Yeah. The day was punctuated with lecture sessions on different aspects of iconography would drag all sorts of stuff off the, off the website. Let me just say a... Uh, oh, no, let me, I'll, 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 I'll say more about Philip and Olga in a moment. So this, any new teacher will challenge us to start all over again, and that's what I did. Everything was new. I was painting at an easel, not bent over a flat table. I was beginning with paper and pencil. I'll talk more about this. Uh, when I'm talking about the uh, crucifix over there. But you'd spend days drawing, rehearsing what you were going to do, learning about different bits of the, of the body, trying it out on paper before a panel was put in front of us. So we were, we were, were drawing, and he provided us with the very best... Uh, equipment. What Rob Gallagher found in Shropshire with Aidan Hart was that he had to take all his own equipment, his own pigments, his own brushes, and he didn't know that Taclon brushes are hopeless. They're just useless for, well, everything. <laughs> but that's what we'd always used. They were cheap, they did the job, yeah. but they don't, they don't have belly, they don't yes. hold the paint. So Philip was providing us with good natural hair brushes, particularly Kalinsky, which is quite a stiff brush, very good for fine work, and Squirrel, which is much softer, which spreads your, your work on, and very good for blending. So blending from, uh, uh, you know, from this level of white through so that you can see what's going on underneath it. I was uh, mixing pigments in the egg tempera with a mortar and pestle, using more egg than I was used to. I was wiping off surplus plant from the brush at least 17 times, 
giving thin layers and a much greater control of the paint. My life was, this, was, was changed. So Sue and I visited, my wife Sue, visited St Petersburg in about 2015. And Philip and Olga showed us their studio. It's, it's a, um, a former Soviet-era apartment, no longer suitable for human habitation. And you can see uh, some of their work there. That, this in the middle here uh, are uh, uh, Olga's work. She does these beautiful. She, she's they, they they both learned art at uh, St Petersburg uh, Academy of Art. They, they have master's degrees in, in art. Uh, she is a designer, and she does these beautiful designs by painting gesso designs on the frames. Just exquisite. What's gesso? Oh, sorry, the gesso is the, is the, uh, the white paste oh. that is painted onto the linen. Yeah. About up to seven, ten coats mm. and then sanded back. So you've got a very smooth white surface. And she's painted those uh, four Celtic saints and the inscriptions are in English, so it's for an English uh, market. Uh, she has ex uh, exhibited and sold work in, in the USA as well. Um, those two over on the side, um, they're Phillips, they were huge, and they're now in a little church outside St. Petersburg. They also... Uh, showed us their church which is just beautiful. Yes. During the Soviet era, 80, 80 to 85 percent of the churches were destroyed. Oh. And this church, which, which was built in 1912 to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty, and it was Tsar Nicholas II's church. This is where he worshipped. During the Soviet era, it became a milk factory. <laughs> and then it went into complete ruin and it's been rebuilt and it is just magnificent. The art is fabulous. And <laughs> this is. They're, re they're re really sensible, very pragmatic in Russia. It's freezing cold in winter. So there's the warmer downstairs church and the more decorated upstairs church for summer. This is the winter church. And that labyrinth is a copy of the labyrinth in uh, Chartres. And, and uh, there's my wife talking with, with Olga. And... Just around the corner from where they are is a, uh, a baptistry. Um, which is quite extraordinary. I didn't get photos of the baptistry because there was a class gathered around it, a class of about 12 adults preparing for baptism the next Easter. Mm -hmm. Upstairs, in the upstairs church, is, and now, everybody who didn't see any pews, no pews. You stand during the very long services. Yeah. And so did the Tsar, but he got to stand in that nice little uh, uh, <laughs> telephone booth. Goggles. <laughs> 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 but but the, uh, oh, the, the iconostasis, there are about a hundred icons in that one, but I don't think they've all been repainted. Some of them are photos, but they're re they were repainting all of those uh, icons in that uh, in that screen. Well, I do need to say something about Philip and Olga and their present state. They are Russians. They are outspoken against Putin. They, uh, on the day of the invasion, this icon of Christ, he's, he's dabbling with uh, in, in caustic. Instead of using uh, egg, he's using melted wax. Anyway, so this 
on Facebook, this icon appeared and he's, he wrote, today my country invaded Ukraine and I am sorry. Forgive me if, I, if there's more that I could have done to stop this. Then they went out on the streets and photographed the streets, filmed the streets of the protesters and you've heard how dangerous that was. Yeah. They drove, they had to get out and they drove two and a half days south to Georgia. They were held up for weather on the border for six days, and then when the border opened, they were sat in their car for 30 hours to get across the border. Yeah. Then they couldn't get accommodation. They're Russian. Yeah. They, uh, they finally, they now have an apartment, and uh, there was a posting that Olga put up uh, the other day, uh, Philip's postings are all sort of very upbeat to get what's really going on to read Olga is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. She says, it's so much worse for the Ukrainians, but it's, you know, for the, those Russians, those uh, in, in exile, it's dangerous. Yeah. Blending, uh, you might have to tell, I feel. Yeah. Yeah. So they're in this <laughs> in Georgia. Oh, and this was a... a, a, a an interesting discovery. If we want to make a, a hue, a colour darker, then we can. There are two paints that are very popular amongst, well, in, in, in my sphere. Burnt umber, which is a sort of a very deep reddy brown, it's actually a, an ochre that has been burnt, and some ochres, when they're burnt, become quite red. Sienna is one of them, but burnt sienna is, is quite red. It's nearly as, it, it can be mistaken for red ochre. So I'm doing this, this blue uh, headdress on uh, Antony of Egypt, and I'm using a, a colour called ultramarine. Ultramarine was a replacement for lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is just gorgeous and just horrendously expensive. So we use ultramarine, <laughs> which is, is very useful. And I'm about to, you know, I need to get it darker at the top and there need to be these shaded areas. Uh, do I use burnt umber or do I use black? Mars black works very well. That would, that would darken it up and it would work really well. But I had heard, of course, as m m many artists have, that uh, what you can consider doing is to use the complementary colour, to, to add a bit of the complementary colour to a colour, to make it darker. The complementary colour, if you think of the colour wheel, you've got the primary colours, the red, yellow and blue, and the secondary colours are those that are mixed. So blue and yellow make green. Uh, what have we got? We've got red and blue make purple. And you're going to get orange there. Well, if blue is there, then the opposite colour, the complementary colour, is orange. Now, ultramarine is bright, it's blingy. In fact, I often knock it back with burnt umber so that it's not in your face. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this is quite blingy. The most blingy uh, orange I've got is called uh, cadmium orange, and it is bright orange. It's brighter than an orange. <laughs> it's bright orange. <laughs> this cannot possibly work, but the artists of, uh, who are wiser than me said it, it does. So I decanted some of my blue paint into a, onto a palette <coughs> and gradually started to add this bright orange cadmium paint and the result was brilliant. Um, it didn't go dull, it just went dark. We describe a colour in three main ways. It's hue, now it's hue refers to it's blue, it's red, it's brown, it's orange. It's tone, that is on a scale of pure white to pure black, that colour can go through that range. And uh, different artists will have, a, have 
different grades. They might have seven, they might have five uh, grades of, of, of tone. The other is more difficult to describe, it's called chroma. And it's that, it's, um, it's, it's brightness. So that, you know, you, you know what a dull colour looks like, and you know what a bright colour looks like. We are tending, your green is a high chroma. Yeah, that's uh, nice green. You, your jumper and your jumper is, is a low chroma. They're, they're, they're muted, muted colours. But what happened by putting this bright orange with this bright blue was to get a darker tone but retain the chroma. Yeah. It was just a magic moment. Yeah. Sometimes to make red darker, add green yeah. and vice versa. Oh, that's a little few. Yeah. So, so I travelled through um, uh, Turkey and Greece, and when we were uh, on Patmos, which of course, as you all know, is where John wrote Revelation, uh, I bought an icon of John the theologian, and I used that as a model to paint this. Again, I've I've copied what I saw in, in that model. I hadn't learnt about uh, highlights, but for this one it's probably just as well because I was copying what I could see in what this artist had done on Patmos. Now, a lot of the people of faith on this list are not... Um, they haven't been canonised by the Pope. And some of them are very modern, uh, some of them are well known. And so far we've been looking at icons and we recognise the icon style. You, you, they, they don't look like um, portraits. But what about those people, those saints, we do know what they look like from their photos. On this visit to the Fyodorovsky Cathedral, this is uh, Philip and Olga's church in St. Petersburg, we were taken up room after room after room. At the top room, there was an artist, an iconographer, painting an icon of Tsarina Alexandra. And Philip and this artist got into a an animated conversation, and then Philip said, told me what they were talking about. He said, he's making her look like her photos. I'm saying, you know, it's got all iconographic. I was saying, how do you do that? <laughs> so that's been a real struggle for me because someone like Thomas Merton, everybody knows what he looks like from his photos. In fact, that was modelled on two photos, uh, one uh, where he was looking out the window and one where, so his body is the looking out the window one and then his face is the other one which is turned around. Everybody knows what he looks like. Now, there are some iconographers who can take the well-known people and paint them in an icon iconographic style. And some of them look like caricatures and I was yeah. fearful that that's what I would do. I, but also, it seems to me that, I mean, this is a formal photo, taken from a formal photo, that Merton would have approved. That's how he wanted to be uh, displayed yeah. to the church and to the world. So who am I to say, well, it's good enough for you, it's good enough for you. So that's the struggle. Um, a, a couple of these icons, this is, this is one, this is... A, another uh, Hildegard of Bingham, um, and we don't know what she looked like, but I really did like this. Uh, this was a, an etching, uh, a German etching that I modelled it on. These two icons have gone on to a platform called uh, Redbubble, and you can put that up and, and sell any kind of product with that image on it. and. Uh, and for various reasons, I put those two up. One, because my sister wanted to give uh, a photo on a panel of Merton to uh, a friend. So the easiest way to do it was to just put it up 
onto this site and somewhere in Cleveland, Ohio, yeah. uh, they've made this thing and then posted it. Which, and, makes, and I get, you know, 36 cents. <laughs> 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 and, but, but these two icons have been quite popular. Yeah. Quite often I'll get an email, oh, somebody has bought your icon of Hildegard of Bingen on a coffee mug or something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the model for this one, uh, <laughs> Julian of Norwich, she was, um, uh, this is modelled on a, uh, an icon where she's patting her cat. And uh, when I showed this to Olga, uh, Olga's English is not as good as Philip's. No cat. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, no. Um, she was better known for her writing than uh, for patting her cat. And a pen is much easier to paint than a cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought this, this was uh, um, a, an interesting uh, study in the way that uh, using thin layers of paint allow what's going on underneath to come through. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two colours behind the white. That's obviously a white garment. Yeah. All the shading is blue and there's pink there as well mm -hmm. coming through. And then I learned about garments and doing the highlights on garments. Of course the trickiest ones to do are black and white. So I was pretty you know, really got stuck into that. Uh, again, it's just using the uh, uh, background colour and then using what we call uh, titanium white, which is a um, very dominant uh, pigment, but applying it in very, very thin coats so that you can still see what's going on underneath. And then to do a complete garment that is, is completely black Yeah. And young Patrick. Oh. Ooh, that's a nice Some of you would have seen, I, I had a, a, a film running before of uh, my painting this from start to finish. Uh, it was whizzing away at 16 times normal speed and of course when you speed up, yeah. uh, it makes it look so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Cuthbert. I've painted Cuthbert a lot of times and for, for various reasons, but again you can see how the folds work. And then uh, we did a session with Philip and Olga on full length figures. Oh. Oh. So where's the button go? Yeah, And of course we have to have them here. Another one which is yeah. ne needed to be recognisable as uh, Alan Walker. Mm. Uh, Andre Rublev, of course, is, is, is the hero of iconography and painted the wonderful uh, Old Testament Trinity. <laughs> when I took this, Philip, when he'd have his workshops, he'd invite everybody concerned to bring their icons and there'd be an exhibition. But he always had reserved the right to not hang something. The only thing he didn't hang of mine was Rublev. Uh -huh. Because he was worried that if any Russians came and saw it, they, you know, they, they might be anxious about it. Because we don't know what Rublev right. looked like. <laughs> but this is modelled on a Russian stamp <laughs> to commemorate <laughs> 400 years of... of, of uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, again, I hadn't learnt about blending. It might have looked a bit different if I had known about that. And I, I did say that uh, this was painted in class over two weeks, so there were ten days. But we had to learn about dimensions and torso. We had to learn about how to get a face 
that is not only turned to the side but turned down, how the proportions will work on that. And then we have to rehearse painting that. And then we have to think about, so how's our figure going to work? So just sketching away, just scrubbing away with pencil. Um, I'll go through all of these. Another, a bit more refined. Just working again and again. And it wasn't until the end of the first week, I think, that we started to do things like uh, first rehearsing how the, the loincloth would work. And how the figure might look on the on the cross and getting the size about about right. Whoop. Yeah, that's nice. And how the muscles in arms and legs work. So uh, and and then you know, by about the second day in the in the second week we got our panel our cross and started to paint. Um, so that was the last workshop that I did with, with Philip. Let me say something about prayer. Iconographers and the Eastern Orthodox churches claim that icon painting is a very special art form. Some want to express their distinction by claiming that icons are written rather than painted. It ranks them as holy documents, not quite scripture, but hallowed. I've come to claim that I paint icons because I don't think painted art is less evocative or capable of conveying meaning than the written word. It's, a, it's an argument that is going on in the church at the moment. I'm just sort of falling down on the, on the painted side. <laughs> It doesn't mean that I don't have a special regard for icons. Icons are certainly art, but they're not just art. And they're not even just religious art. I like to describe icons as liturgical art because they belong to the prayer of the church. Among the faithful in the Orthodox world, icons hold a central place in their devotional life. Icons will have a special place as a focus for prayer in their homes. So, so th these, these are in, in uh, Russian, uh, an old Russian has on an island in, in Russia, uh, in a safe place, up on a, on a, uh, in the corner of, of the room. Um, in Western Christian homes, family or personal devotions will normally focus on written texts, reading from scripture, set prayers for times of the day and seasons, formal morning prayer in Anglicanism, of course, and the even song may be read or sung. But when I was on Crete, I watched people at their personal devotions in a church called the Church of St Titus. Titus was the first bishop. He was left there by, uh, by Paul to, uh, <laughs> to whip the troops into shape, really. In the narthex, was a very large font with water in it. The nave uh, was festooned with icons of Christ, his mother and many saints, especially Titus. In a side chapel, there is a skull of Titus. It, you can't see it, it's under a gold cover within a glass dome. And there's also an icon of Saint Ath uh, Anastasia, who they pronounce as Anastasia. Some of the pronunciations, like uh, I mentioned the, the, the icon screen, which we would pronounce as iconostasis, in Greek it's uh, iconostasis, mm. um, Christ Pantocrata, Christ... Pan they pronounce it Pantocrata, we've been at Pantocrata, mm. <laughs> so I, I get a bit confused. I've got to watch who, I'm, who my audience is. Uh, and... Uh, so there was this uh, icon of uh, Saint Anastasia with lots of ribbons or of paper with names written on them. The faithful pray through Saint Anastasia for healing. I noticed particularly a young tradie in working clothes 
high-vis vest, he entered the church, dipped his hand in the water of the font, strode into the chapel, placed his hand on the glass dome that protected the skull of St Titus, touched the icon of St Anastasia and left, presumably to go to work. In the doorway he turned back to face into the church and made the sign of the cross three times. No words, no songs, no spoken prayers. But before he went to his daily tasks, the young man remembered he is baptised, paid homage to the saint who had brought Christianity to his island, commended the sick for God's healing and declared his faith in the triune God, who for his sake died and by the power of the Spirit had risen again. That was his devotions. We probably don't ask ourselves why we look at a picture. We just do. We like looking at pictures. We like their colours. We like their topic. We like their composition. Pictures evoke memories and feelings. Pictures stimulate ideas and desires. We don't ask why we're looking at pictures, but if we did, some of the reasons I have just given might apply to us and our thinking. The same will apply when we look at an icon. But if icons are linked to the prayer of the church, should there not be some other things going on in our encounter with these holy images? Well, put most simply, they will remind us of stories and characters from the scriptures. We will burst into spontaneous words of prayer? Probably not. Although the Eastern Church does have a particular prayers associated with festivals and their icons. Here are two Greek prayers offered at Pentecost when an icon depicting the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit as tongues of fire or an icon representing the Holy Trinity. Now, this is what I've recently learned from Aidan Hart's new monumental monster book. Blessed art thou, O Christ our God. Thou hast revealed the fishermen as most wise by sending down upon them the Holy Spirit. Through them thou drewest the world into thy net, O lover of mankind, glory to thee. And another prayer. When the Most High came down and confused the tongues, he divided the nations, but when he distributed the tongues of fire, he called all to unity. Therefore, with one voice, we glorify the All-Holy Spirit. So there are set prayers associated with, particularly with festivals, that are associated with icons. A problem that Westerners have with iconography is our perception of what is happening when Orthodox Christians encounter icons. The touching, the crossing of themselves, the genuflecting, the kissing looks a lot, like, a lot like the icon is being worshipped. Orthodox doctrine is very clear on this point. It has been reiterated throughout the centuries. Only God is worshipped. Christians may pray through the saints. Their icons may be venerated but not worshipped. They are made of matter with human hands. They are not divine. Nevertheless, they provide a link with the divine. Having said that, there are a lot of ancient icons that are associated with miracles, but that's another story. It's often said of icons that they provide a window on heaven. Is this the link with the divine? Julia Bridget Hayes, an iconographer in Athens, says that this idea comes from the Western Church, not from the East. She argues that from the beginning, the teachers of the church saw icons as a means by which Christ and the saints come to us, not us to them. See, if you're saying it's a window on heaven, it's us going to the window. She's saying, no, 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 no. They're coming to look at us. She says, the purpose of the icon is not to lead us out of this world, but to make Christ and the saints present with us here and now in our own time and space, the very thing that happens in the divine liturgy. So that the coin is flipped. Yes, gazing at an icon may give us a glimpse on heaven, just as we, as one of our uh, prayers after the Eucharist, uh, that we have been given a glimpse of the heavenly banquet. We've been taken close to what, to, to the divine. But, but it's also perhaps more tr real that the heavenly banquet has come to us. In, in the Eucharist. The icon, the realm of the divine, comes to look upon us. God is with us. As John's Gospel reminds us, the Word became flesh and lived among us. 
In our icon school classes, we have a worship time. An icon is set before us. In that image, Christ or a saint or a story from scripture comes to greet us. We read a, a biography of the saint, so it is not just the image, but the story that tells us why this person is remembered as holy, as a saint. The time of reflection concludes with prayer giving thanks to God for the example of holy living uh, given to us. If possible, words of the saint are offered as the spoken prayer. I have to say that this is not an Eastern Orthodox custom of prayer. This is a very Western thing to do. It's a tricky thing for the Western Church, especially for Protestants. We were taught for centuries not to make images of holy things, but now we are embracing this ancient art form. We are touched by the liturgical tradition the Orthodox are giving us in their icons. We can remind our Protestant ancestors that Christ is the icon of the invisible God, that humankind was created in God's image, therefore representing that image with paint on panels is okay. Yeah. By those images coming to us from the divine places through icons, our prayers are enriched. <laughs>